in the late 1940s, the appearance of the first Soviet strategic bombers like the Tupolev Tu-4 prompted the United States Air Force to launch the development of a series of interceptors to protect the territory of the United States against this potential threat. Initially, the development of the Lockheed F-94 Starfire and the Northrop F-89 Scorpion was accelerated to meet this need, but it was clear that they were just a temporary solution. So, in October 1948, a senior Air Force committee recommended a project to build the ultimate interceptor, scheduled to enter service in 1954. That was the name they chose, the Ultimate Interceptor. In January 1950, the Air Force officially launched the program, but did something different than the usual. While the whole program was named WS-201A, the requirements were split in two. The requirement MX 1179 covered the armament and the fire control. The requirement MX 1554 covered the plane itself. MX 1179 was won by Hughes in July 1950, and we will come back to it. MX 1554 was the subject of a tough competition, with all the American aeronautic world eager to win the race. In the same July 1950, the Air Force reduced the participants to Lockheed, Republic, and Convair. Lockheed dropped out, they had a lot on their plate already. Uh, Republic took a very long time, and in the end, it they were only capable of producing a mock-up. Convair, on the contrary, had an extremely clear vision about this project. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we're going to discuss is very hard to find on YouTube. Years immediately after the war, Convair became the first American aerospace company to acquire experience with the Delta Wing. With the help of the NACA and the mentoring of the father of the Delta Wing, Alexander Lipisch, they built the XF-92A. It was an experimental Delta Wing aircraft that allowed them to accumulate experience with the new configuration. On the basis of that experience, Convair was sure to master the technology to create the outstanding interceptor that the Air Force wanted. In November 1950, Convair was given the go-ahead for the development of the prototype, the YF-102. As it often happens with the development of new technologies, problems and delays happened. The engine should have been the Curtis Wright J67 derived from the British turbojet Olympus, but its program was late, so it was replaced with the Wessinghaus J40, which turned out to be a fiasco and it was scrapped. So in the end, the Convair settled for the Pratt & Whitney J57 as a temporary measure. The fire control system that Hughes was supposed to build was not ready yet, so it was replaced on the prototypes with a less capable unit called the A9. However, despite all these setbacks, the prototype was built and it flew for the first time on the 23rd of October 1953, only to crash nine days later because of an engine flame out on takeoff, with the pilot luckily ejecting to safety. There had been no much time to test the plane, but the few data acquired were not really promising. In any case, Convair used the time allowed by this setback to build an improved prototype, which finally flew the 11th of January 1954. When Convair engineers finally put the plane to the test, they were not prepared for what happened. The major advantage of the Delta Wing was the, its benign behavior at transonic speed, if compared with swept wings or even short and stubby wings. The YF-102 was designed to be supersonic to quickly intercept the incoming bombers. Such beautiful and slender aircraft with its futuristic delta wings was expected to easily pass Mach 1. 
Unfortunately, it did not. Conver engineers were shocked to learn that the maximum speed in level flight was Mach 0.98, way below the specification. The drag seemed to be much higher than expecting, slowing the aircraft down. And since when it rains it pours, the J57 engine was not producing the expected thrust. It was a frantic back to the drawing board because the survival of the program was at stake. Luckily, they came across an idea that had the potential to save the day. And actually the new idea had a name, Richard Withcomb. Richard Withcomb was a NECA engineer who in 1952 had come up with a bizarre idea. He made a lot of aerodynamic experiments with slender aerodynamic bodies with wings, but with variable cross-section and it seemed that sort of pinching the body in the middle like a bottle of a coke was reducing the transonic and supersonic drag. After a lot of work, he came up with a sonic area rule that seemed to offer guidance for the project of a transonic aircraft. Um, actually, to be fair, the area rule might have been discovered independently at least a couple of times in the, in the 40s, but the official historiography gives the credit to Whitcomb, who we know for sure did it independently. Convair offered Whitcomb a generous contract to help in the redesign of the YF-102 prototype. But before going on with our story, we need to understand what the sonic area rule is. The high drag experienced by the YF-102 seemed to come from the interference between the wing and the fuselage. Classic methodologies to calculate the total drag of a plane added the fuselage drag to the wing drag. It was well known that there was some extra drag due to the interference between the two, but at subsonic speeds it was almost negligible and nobody really cared. However, Nearing Mach 1, the extra drag was sharply rising beyond the expected values. And also, quite puzzlingly, on swept wing planes, the wing tunnel test had shown that a shockwave was occurring toward the tip of the wing, which seemed to contribute to the extra drag, and it also could create issues to the control surfaces. Of course, near the speed of sound, you have shockwaves that generate extra drag, but of course, nearing the speed of sound, you have shock waves that generate extra drag, but why should you have one there? And why this extra drag seemingly coming out of nowhere that could only be attributed to the interference between the wing and the fuselage? Whitcomb's stroke of genius was exactly to understand what was really happening. One step back. Why quick planes mostly have swept back wings? The reason is to delay and limit the effect of the air being compressible, which means delaying the formation of shocks that create extra drag. Why is this important? Because the aerofoil, or anything with a camber for what matters, uh, like a delta wing, accelerates the airflow on the upper surface and slows down the flow on the lower surface. If the leading edge is tilted in respect to the flow velocity, only the component of the speed perpendicular to the leading edge actually increases or decreases. In fact, the camber forces the air to accelerate to flow upward and above the wing, but the edgewise component doesn't see any change in thickness, so it's not affected. Please notice that this is a geometric formalism, but it explains what happens for real. What happens on the upper surface when the perpendicular component is increased? Better, what happens to the total velocity? Well, it turns inward, toward the fuselage. Look at these tapes on the wing of the XF-92A. You can clearly see that this one is tilted inward. So if the tilt happens in the middle of the wing, no big deal, but what about in proximity of the wing root? The air can't turn inward because there is a solid surface forcing it to go straight, that is, the fuselage wall. Since we are close to the speed of sound, the airflow is 
energetic, and to deviate it and make it straight, the fuselage must exert quite a pressure on the air. This pressure actually propagates along the wing, causing small shocks that tend to coalesce at the tip of the wing in larger and potentially dangerous shocks, like the one we have seen before. All this convoluted airflow sucks energy to be generated and thus extra drag is generated. Now we know the problem, but what is the solution? Very easy, move a piece of the fuselage out of the way, making it thinner to let the flow move inward with no disturbance. This is what is usually referred as pinching or coke bottle shape. The size of the fuselage may increase when the flow slows down toward the back of the wing because the flow, in this case, will naturally want to move outward. How much do the fuselage need to be narrowed? Here is Whitcomb's second stroke of genius. He came up with a simple geometric description for the sonic area rule. If a wing body combination including the external stores, is so designed that the axial distribution of the cross-sectional area normal to the airflow is the same as that of a minimum drag body, then the wing body combination will also have the minimum drag. Easy, isn't it? So in practice, in cutting a lot of corners. Take a slender body that gives the minimum drag attainable in transonic conditions with the same length and the same volume as the plane. Cut it into slices like a salami and measure the area of each slice. Do the same to the plane. Make sure that the plane slices have the same area as the body slices in the corresponding positions. Since a slice that includes the wing must have a large area, the only way to reduce it is to narrow the fuselage. So what happened to the YF-102 after applying the area rule to the design? The first modified prototype flew on the 20th of December 1954. During its second test, it went supersonic in level flight. In the following days, it reached the speed of Mach 1.25, satisfying the Air Force requirement. The first production plane flew in June 1955 and entered service in April 1956, starting a long and honorable career. But this is the subject of the next video. So if you like this video, I'm sure you will find interesting also the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe, hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could uh, support the channel on Patreon and subscribe star, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, stay safe. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time. And stop. Neanche terribile, eh? Dire la verità.